Welcome to Modern Mana's Health and Healing Crusade. Through the years, Modern Mana has been dedicated to spreading the message of physical, mental, and spiritual restoration through the gospel of Jesus Christ. From cooking schools and nutritional counseling, to Bella Vida, a lifestyle education home, to crusades featuring world-renowned teachers and healers, Modern Mana has inspired thousands to embrace a new lifestyle that promotes health and the reversal of sickness and disease, resulting in a life filled with joy and peace. Join us now as Dr. John McDougall presents The Role of Meat in the Human Diet. What is this, the fourth year? More, he says, it's more. <laughs> and I talked Dr. McDougall into spending two days with us this year instead of one. It wasn't an easy, it was not an easy thing to do either. <laughs> but we've, we've got to become pretty good friends and you know, when I think of vegetarianism, there's two names that always come to my mind, and it's John Robbins and it's John McDougall. And I believe that John has played a very pivotal role in bringing the light of a plant-based diet to the public and to the United States of America. He has a number of books he's authored. He has DVDs on lifestyle and they'll both be available at the end of these meetings at the back booth, so don't try to rush back there now at a very fair, fair price. But I love this man. I love his work. He is a, another advocate for truth. He will not compromise. As I said earlier, one of the prominent alternative medicine men waved the white flag with the Atkins program and Dr. McDougall and I had a talk and he says you'll never see me waving the white flag there's no compromise when it comes to lives so let's welcome Dr. John McDougall with a warm welcome thank you Danny thank you Danny it's 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 always good to be here especially after this week I um, spent the week talking to a group of doctors and you know, they were really offended by my presentation. Yeah, they were offended because I got real serious about it. Because, you know, instead of presenting things in a very formal, very impersonal way, I got real personal, real formal right in their face. And I said, you know, I'm not talking about repairing televisions or a, a gasket blowing out of your car. I'm talking about people. I'm talking about wives and husbands and mothers and fathers and children that are suffering and dying because of the misinformation and the nonsense that goes on. They actually allowed a doctor to speak at this particular conference I was at to speak about the advantages of eating lots of meat and lots of protein. Yes, and I said, that will not stand. I will do everything I can to discredit this man publicly, but professionally and politely, and I did. He had a tough week, let me tell you. So, to be here, to be here is a pleasure because, you know, I feel like I'm among friends, to say the least, to be here. But who knows? If you'd like to be challenging, that's fine, too. I enjoy that. It's just uh, I, I get a little frustrated with some of my colleagues because they just somehow can't see the urgency of getting this straightened out. And the evidence is overwhelming. And what I'd like to do with you today is share you, with you some of the evidence that I ask you to look at as well as them. We have the first slide, please. Okay. What does Mark Twain tell us? He tells us the truth is mighty and will prevail. There's nothing the matter with this except for it ain't so. <laughs> and isn't that the state of the world today? Isn't that the way it is? Can you absolutely believe that your friends and relatives believe and follow a practice of eating pork rinds for good health? <laughs> it's, it's, you know... If you'd, asked me, if you'd asked me 15 years ago if this could have ever happened, that we'd have a society, in fact, a whole world that believes that good health comes from eating as much meat, as much dairy as you can possibly stuff in your face, I'd have told you you were crazy. As a matter of fact, I remember a conversation I had with my book publisher, which was Penguin at that time. They're Penguin Putnam now. It was back in the late 80s. They said to me, McDougall, we want you to change your style of writing. We think high-protein diets are going to be popular here in the very near future. 
and so we'd like you to start writing high protein diet books. And I says, I bet you think I'm just writing books and I really don't believe what I say. They said, look, you're of the 80s and the high protein diet guys are of the 90s, face it. And I laughed at them. I said it could never happen, why? Because the truth is the truth and the science is solid that these diets are dangerous and the right kind of diet for people to eat is a plant-based diet. I, I never believed such a thing could happen. I was wrong, obviously wrong. But hopefully it will change soon. Hopefully the truth will prevail. Over half of the U.S. population is either on a low-carb diet, has tried a low-carb diet, or plans to be on a low-carb diet. Now you understand what I mean by carbs. I'm talking about carbohydrates are plant foods. Meat has no carbohydrate in it. Carbohydrates are starches, vegetables, and fruits. And get used to that word. Starch means plant, whole plant food. It means carbohydrate. It's a better term, more scientific term than complex carbohydrate. Starch really is the term that you ought to be thinking about when you think about th what you should be eating. Don't think about starch as thinking it's something that you're going to stiffen your shirts with. Starch is the scientific word for carbohydrate. The Atkins diet has gotten to the point where TGIF Fridays advertised up until last week. I just checked their website. You won't find it now. But they advertised up until last week their Atkins approved menu. They still have this up there. They still tell you you can order Atkins approved meals, which is a sizzling New York strip steak. Or another choice is a bunless burger made with two patties of beef. But the thing that is so concerning is this. They ended the menu with the following statements. They said, this not only helps you lose weight, but reduces risk factors associated with serious diseases, including diabetes and heart disease. That's right. Now, I, I know why they took it down, because they are either going to get sued, or they were worried about getting sued. And they should be sued. But that kind of irresponsible discussion to say that you can, essentially that message is you can prevent heart disease and diabetes by eating globs of meat. And it's just, just the opposite. And people will die hearing that kind of message. It's gotten so bad that Burpee's Peas, you know the seed seller Burpee? Burpee's Peas now advertise low carbohydrate seeds that you can buy. Yeah, that's right. Our creator made a mistake by putting carbohydrate in the plants, I guess, because Burpee's is trying to correct that and telling you you can order actual seeds that will grow low carbohydrate plants, which is complete nonsense. They say lettuce and cucumbers and radishes and broccoli and celery are the ones you should choose. Think about those are the traditional diet foods that people always chose to lose weight. And you avoid onions and green peas and parsnips and winter squash. What nonsense. Plant foods contain carbohydrates. Here are some of the percentages. Of the calories that are present in plant foods, these calories, this amount of calories, is from carbohydrate. For example, beans, 72%, carrots, 92%. Whereas meat has virtually no carbohydrate. That means beef, chicken, fish, lobster, zero. Cheese, about 2% of the calories are carbohydrate. So when you are talking about a low carbohydrate meal plan, you are talking about avoiding plant foods and instead focusing on animal foods. That's the message. And so I may mention carbohydrate, I may mention plant foods, but you interchange the two because you know how they are associated now. I just did a review. In fact, <laughs> I wasn't here five minutes on the grounds, and somebody ran up to me and said, look, I have this terrible dilemma. My friends are telling me that the Atkins diet is good for them because the Atkins diet not only causes people to lose weight, but their cholesterol gets better, their triglycerides get better, their blood sugar gets better. Well, I spent about three weeks last month reviewing the Atkins research. And Atkins has a bit of research. After all, it's a $100 million a year business, and he has a research fund that has millions of dollars dedicated to Atkins research. So you would expect research, and of course you would expect it to favor Atkins. But the truth of the matter is, when you look at the scientific studies, and I reviewed them all, and they're all there for you to look at. If you go to my website and you look at the May 2004 newsletter, you can go through this. Anybody says to you, the Atkins diet is so wonderful, the science proves it, you say, well, here, look at this evaluation of the science. And I guarantee you, you will find nobody who will find fault with what I said. 
They may not like it, but they won't find fault with it. If you look at the studies, for example, on weight loss, what you find is the two long-term studies, two long-term studies, those are 12-month studies, shows the Atkins diet doesn't do any better than a low-fat diet. Now you say to yourself, low-fat diet, I know what that means, that's like, like Ornish recommends, or McDougal, or Pritikin, that's a low-fat diet. No, that's not what a low-fat diet is. In their minds, because they want to deceive you, a low-fat diet is actually 30% fat. The diet I recommend is around 7% fat because that's what, that's what our creator put into the food. Okay? Potatoes are around 1% fat, corn's around 10% fat, rice is around 8% fat, oranges are around 4% fat. You add it all together and nature and our food put, made our food in such a way that it's about 7% fat. But when you read the headlines in the paper and the studies, what you say is when they compare the Atkins diet with a low-fat diet, the Atkins diet wins out. They never compared the Atkins diet with a low-fat diet. They've compared it with the American diet. Let me give you a specific example. There's a researcher by the name of Samaya that did a study at the Veterans Hospital. He started out with a group of veterans, and their diet was 33% fat. The goal on the diet, the low-fat diet, was 30% fat. At the end of the study, the people in the experimental group on the low-fat diet were eating 33% fat. So where's the low-fat diet? It's fraud. It's deceit. They're lying to the public. Same thing with uh, improving lipids. Uh, yes, it lowers triglycerides, but no, it doesn't lower cholesterol. As a matter of fact, it raises cholesterol, it raises bad cholesterol. The reason you get any good results at all because of the Atkins diet is because of its underlying mechanism. And by the way, I got this published this year in March in Mayo Clinic Proceedings, a respected medical journal. I got this particular statement published in an article I wrote about the Atkins diet for all doctors to read. The way the Atkins diet works is this. If you read any of the papers, what you find is people who are on this diet, they go into a state known as ketosis. With ketosis, what happens is your appetite is suppressed. You become nauseated. You become lethargic. These are all symptoms of illness. The way the Atkins diet works is it makes you sick. And when you're sick, you don't eat. You don't eat as much cholesterol or fat or sugar or anything else. And as a result, things appear to get better. But are they really better? I can make your cholesterol go down, your blood sugar go down, your weight go down, by putting you on chemotherapy. <laughs> How many doctors would brag about their patient losing weight or lowering their blood pressure or cholesterol if they were on chemotherapy? Another way of making people sick. Anyway, you can read all about that if you want to go to the uh, May 2004 McDougal newsletter on my website. The American Heart Association addressed these folks, and they stated in their paper, which appears in circulation in October of 2001, they said high-protein diets are not recommended because they restrict healthy foods. Individuals who follow these diets are therefore at risk for compromised vitamin and mineral intake, as well as potential cardiac, renal, bone, liver abnormalities overall. That's what the American Heart Association Nutrition Committee says. They say high-protein diets may also be associated with an increased risk of coronary heart disease. That means heart attacks due to increased intakes of fat, cholesterol, and other dietary factors. And don't you dare feed a diabetic a high-protein diet because you'll wipe their kidneys out and hurry their journey to the dialysis ward. Yet, by the way, the professor who spoke last week at the same conference I did talked about how good it was to feed diabetics a high-protein diet. So why do, these, why do these diets persist? Why, why are they out there? Why do they succeed? I don't really have all the answers for it, but I have a couple of them. One is people like to hear good news about their bad habits. You tell me I can lose weight and get healthy by chewing down on uh, pork chops and pork rinds and Parmesan cheese, and yeah, I'll go for it. People love to hear good news about their bad habits. Plus, when money speaks, the truth is kept silent. And there's a ton of money in the meat industry and the beef industry, they are absolutely thrilled with these kinds of diets. And of course, it does a lot for my business too. People who follow these kinds of diets are going to be a lot sicker, which will require a lot more, a lot more doctor treatments. Okay, your friends are confused, maybe you're confused, but I want to address this from a point of view that will get rid of all the confusion. What I want to do is go through some thinking with you to see if we can figure out what the optimal diet is for people. 
And there must be an optimal diet for people, don't you think? I mean, I got all these pets at home. I, I love animals, okay? I have this wonderful bird, and I know what my bird eats. My macaw lives on nuts and seeds and fruits and vegetables. And I got this really neat kitty cat at home, too. And I feed my kitty cat meat. And I got a great dog at home, too. And I don't know exactly what he's supposed to eat. I've got all these lovely animals at home. I've had a horse in the past. I know what the horse eats. And you know something? I have yet to find my cat enjoying walnuts. And I don't dare feed my macaw beef. In other words, there's a diet for each and every animal that as, as people who love our animals, we make sure that they get the right kinds of foods because we want them to stay healthy, right? Everybody knows what those diets are, and you'd never mix them up because you know your animals would be sick and dead. If you fed your racehorse cat food, what would happen? You'd have a sick, dead racehorse, and that would be no fun. So there must be a diet for each and every animal, yet what do we feed ourselves and our children and our, our spouses and our parents? What do we feed them? We feed them foods that if you fed them to animals, what would happen is the Humane Society would put you in jail. If you gave your dog cakes and ice cream and cookies, the Humane Society would be after you. But you can get away with your kids, can't you? Yeah. And yourselves and your parents and so on. And that doesn't make it right. So let's look for the op optimal diet for human beings. First thing I want to do is touch upon religious teachings. To me, religious teachings, and I know what the orientation is here, so certainly I'm going to have a, a great interest in covering this, covering this particular teaching thoroughly, but religious teachings to me, in addition to everything else you believe, are a testament to human knowledge and history. Because they've been around for thousands of years. And if the teachings weren't true, then they would be discarded, don't you think? Regardless of what a religious value you want to put with these teachings, if these particular books, these particular teachings are kept around for thousands of years, they must be valid. Or they discard them. Why would you keep nonsense around? And so we have Genesis telling us, uh, God said, Behold, I give you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, and it shall be your food. You're all familiar with that one. How about the Mormons? I get in lots of trouble with the Mormons because I always throw a Mormon doctrine 89 in their face and they don't like it. But I'm sorry, this is what it says. It says all grain is ordained for the use of man and, and of beasts. And these, referring to the meats, has God made for use of man only in times of feast and famine. I mean, that's what it says. Famine or excess hunger. And that's what Mormon Doctrine 89 says, but I can't tell you the number of uh, Latter-day Saints that are upset with me, and they don't want to hear that they're supposed to be vegetarians. I didn't write it. How about the Hindus? I love this one. Karmic consequences. The Hindus teach, and many of them are vegetarians, by involving oneself in the cycle of inflicting injury, pain and death, even indirectly by eating other creatures, one must in the future experience in equal measure the suffering caused. Yeah. How about this one? Buddha says to become a vegetarian is a step into the stream which leads to nirvana. Teachings that have been around for hundreds and thousands of years. But my favorite one is this. This one is about my practice of medicine. It's about Daniel. You all know this story, so I'll just paraphrase it for you. It's about Daniel and his men. The men aren't doing too well, talks to the gatekeeper, says, look, I'd like to do an experiment. Right, it was not a double-blind, placebo-controlled experiment. <laughs> but he says, I want to do an experiment. What I want to do is I want to feed my men vegetables and water, pulses and water. And I want you to evaluate them 10 days later. And so he did. He evaluated them 10 days later, and he found the men to be healthier than those who continued to eat the royal food. I know of no passage in the Bible that talks about eating the Atkins diet or the zone, or the South Beach. But I do know a passage in the, in the Bible that talks about eating what I teach and what Danny teaches. And that's because, that's because it's the truth. That's why the story is still in the Bible. If it wasn't the truth, they'd have thrown it out. 
This is a story that talked about eating meat and, and uh, for 10 days they'd gotten rid of it. They said that's stupid. People get constipated and headaches and sick and why would we keep that story in? Okay, let's talk about <clears throat> current writings from ma major health organizations and what they say about diet. The USDA, they have the food pyramid. And that says that the basis of the diet needs to be grains and other kinds of starches. Then you have fruits and vegetables. Look at that pyramid carefully. On top you get next the meats and the dairy and then at the very tip of the pyramid you get to eat anything you want. Cookies, candies, oils, it doesn't matter. That's what the pyramid says. Now that pyramid is designed based upon making a lot of people happy including industry and those who happen to be eating roast beef sandwiches for lunch who are making the policies. If you want the truth, if you want to really know what the science says, you just take the top of the pyramid, you lop it off, you throw it away, and you have what I call the McDougal trapezoid, which is a starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables. Now, the Atkins people, they have their own food pyramid. They did a knockoff of this, and they've tried to convince people based using a similar design that's very familiar that they got the pyramid upside down, the USDA did, and Atkins has it right, and you know that's just nonsense. The World Health Organization says eat a nutritious diet based on a variety of foods originating mainly from plants rather than animals. The American Cancer Society says eat a variety of healthful foods with an emphasis on plant sources. Limit consumption of red meats, especially those high in fat and those that are processed. The National Cancer Institute says that colon cancer is caused by high protein, high fat, high meat diets. Every single health organization in the world has the same message. That is, you should eat more plants and less animals. There is no exception. The Diabetic Associations tell us it is the position of the American Dietetic Association and the Dietitians of Canada that appropriately planned vegetarian diets are healthful, nutritionally adequate, and provide health benefits in the prevention and treatment of certain diseases. So there is consistency. Now let's take a look at some famous researchers in a plant-based diet. These are what I call my heroes, and if you ever spend time with me at my clinic in Santa Rosa, one of the things I'll do almost every day is I will tell you about the people whose shoulders I stand upon, about people who have talked about good nutrition for, for years, hundreds of years. And these are the people that I study that I have great respect for. I've just simply stated they're my heroes. There are people like Russell Henry Chittenden, who I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about in a minute. He was the head of Yale's biochemistry department. He's the father of biochemistry. Walter Kepner, who set up Duke's program, the rice diet at Duke University. In the 1950s, Walter Kepner had published essentially all the things that I do today in my practice of medicine. He showed that you could uh, take people with severe high blood pressure. I'm talking like 210 over 140. Not the wimpy blood pressure you guys are on pills for. He would take and put them on, on a rice diet and he would reverse their blood pressure. He would take in large hearts and reverse them to normal in half the cases. Uh, electrocardiograms that were abnormal, they'd reverse to normal by putting them on this kind of diet. He'd stop kidney failure. He would reverse diabetic retinopathy. All this is published in the 1950s. Walter Kepner was the most famous thing at Duke University for 40 years, the rice diet. We have Roy Swank. Roy Swank was the head of neurology at the University of Oregon for 23 years. He used a low-fat, plant-based, low-animal food diet to treat multiple sclerosis. It's the, only, it's the only treatment that works. The only way you can stop this disease. He has research on over 5,000 patients. It involves 50 years of research, 200 published papers that say that if you have multiple sclerosis, the chance of you getting worse if you follow a healthy diet over the next 35 years is less than 5%. If you follow any other therapy, I don't care if you spend $12,000 or $15,000 or $20,000 a year on it, your risk of being dead wheelchair bound or bedridden within 10 years is 50%. We have Dennis Burkett, he's the fiber man. I love to talk about Dennis Burkett. Someday maybe I'll give you a whole hour lecture about how that man taught me the important things that I know today. Here's a doctor who was the head of the Ministries of Health of Uganda. He trained in Edinburgh, Scotland, learned how to be a surgeon to treat heart disease, diabetes, hemorrhoids, varicose veins, deep vein thrombosis, appendicitis. But he became the head of the Ministries of Health of Uganda in Africa and he practiced there 15 years and he didn't find any of these diseases. And he blamed it on the fact that, that these people ate a high-fiber diet. And of course, you all know fiber is only present 
in plants. Nathan Pritikin, many of you are familiar with, James Anderson at the University of Kentucky Medical School, treated diabetics in the mid-70s with the diet I recommend and was able to get most diabetics off of insulin, about two-thirds to three-quarters, type 2, by the way, type 2 diabetics, and essentially all of them off of their diabetic pills. And, of course, you know Dean Ornish's famous studies on reversing heart disease. So see, these are some of my heroes. I want to talk to you about protein for a minute. Protein is one of those things that's really hard for you to get over, and, of course, you associate protein with meat and eating dairy products. Did you ever wonder how people reach the the recommendation for your protein requirements. <clears throat> it was done in the uh, late 1800s. And it was done by well-meaning scientists like Carl Voigt from Germany and Charles Atwater from the United States and various other investigators. This is what they did. No more, no less. They looked at the populations around them and they came to the conclusion that people would intuitively choose the right foods. So if you weren't wealthy enough to make these choices, you obviously couldn't be included in the discussion. So they had to include soldiers and laborers and office people, more successful people. If you could afford to eat meat or plant foods, all kinds of different foods, obviously their assessment was people would intuitively choose the right thing. And so they looked at what people who were wealthier in their societies ate, and they decided that's how much protein you need. The arrogance, the stupidity. I mean, look at your friends and relatives. Do they intuitively choose Krispy Kreme donuts correctly? <laughs> I promise you that is all the research that was done to determine the protein needs that your doctor recommends for you today. It was based on social bigotry, assuming wealthy people are smarter than people who can't afford to eat rich food. That was all it was due to. Well, <clears throat> a guy named Russell Henry Chitton did he was upset about this, and Russell Henry Chitton did, he, as I said, was head of biochemistry at Yale University in the uh, early 1900s, published his book, uh, Physiological Economy and Nutrition, in 1904. Now, he had a problem with the current recommendations, and his problem was this, is when he looked around the world, like, for example, he looked in Central America, he looked in Africa, he looked in Asia, he saw millions of people living on protein intakes about half as much as these folks were recommending. They were recommending 130 to 180 grams a day. He saw people living on 60, 70, 80 grams a day. And he says, you know, there's something probably wrong. Plus, he met vegetarians. And he said, they're alive. My goodness, they're alive. How could they be alive eating 40, 50, 60 grams of protein a day when everybody knows they shouldn't be? And so he's decided to test this out. And so what he did is he did some experiments. The first one was on himself. I mean, you don't run and rush into this. You might hurt somebody. So he tested himself. And he changed his diet from around 120 grams of protein a day to 40 grams of protein a day. And he lost weight and he felt better. And his arthritic knees improved to the point where they didn't bother him anymore. And he was so excited. So what he did next is he took, he took uh, some of his colleagues. He took five of the Yale faculty and he put them on the diet. He carefully chose these faculty as people who didn't exercise. Because he didn't want to overdo this now. He didn't want to rush into it. And he put them on the diet. They lost weight and felt better. And next he took people who exercised a little more. He took 13 hospital corpsmen from the army. They were more physically active, plus they vigorously ex exercised one day a week. He put them on the diet, and they all thrived and lost weight. And then his final test, he took seven Yale athletes. These are Olympic athletes. He put them on the diet, and they improved their performance by 35%. And that was in 1904 this was published, 100 years ago, and still the same nonsense about protein is being taught. One of my other heroes is William Rose. He published his work in, final work in 1952. He published 16 papers which are in the journals of biochemistry which are considered nutritional classics. Some of the most important papers ever published in the scientific literature were published by William Rose. He started out studying rats. Why did he study rats? Because rats were the model for nutrition. And some investigators by the name of Osborne and Mendel, they did some studies back in 1913 that showed, you maybe remember these studies, they were published in your textbook. In your textbooks, what it showed was when you, when you fed the rats vegetable protein, they grew poorly. That was class B or inferior protein. And then when you add a little meat to the rat's diet, they grew great, and so meat was class A or superior protein. Do you remember those charts? I, I had them in my books. Well, that's from Osborne and Mendel's experiments in 1913. 
Now, what Osborne and Mendel didn't figure out back then was that rats weren't people. And so as a result, they got it wrong. But William Rose came around to figuring that out. He straightened that all out by doing this. He took his college students and he put them on various kinds of diets to determine what they needed in terms of protein and amino acids. And he found out that we were more efficient than rats and that our amino acid requirements and protein requirements were very small. As a matter of fact, this chart, which you'll find in many of my books, uh, this chart right here, which you'll find in many of my books, clearly shows what Rose found, and that is that amino acid requirements and protein requirements are easily met by any single plant food. Not only are, are the requirements that are determined, that are designated as recommended requirements met, but requirements that are, rec that are designated, excuse me, not only are requirements that are, re that are designated as minimum are met, but requirements that are twice that large, which are designated as recommended, are met by any single plant food. Now, people should have been able to figure this out because they actually had this data in the 1930s and 40s, and that's the data on the protein content of the milk of various animals. And what you find is the protein content of human breast milk is very, very low. We have 1.2 grams for every 100 grams of fluid milk. Now, why is the protein content in humans so low? The reason is, is because humans grow slowly. It takes about 17 years for a human to grow from birth to adulthood. Whereas animals that grow faster, they need more protein. So if you look at the protein content of various animals and you look at their rate of growth, you see why other animals have different needs for protein. For example, a cow doubles in size in 47 days, whereas a human being takes 180 days. And a cat doubles in size in 10 days. Look at the difference in protein content of these various animals. You see as you in increase the rate of growth, you need more protein. See, so that was Osborne and Mendel's basic mistake. Okay, so let's take, we've looked at some of the historical figures in terms of our, our scientists. Let's take a look at some anatomy and physiology here for a minute. Now I understand most of you here believe uh, in creation as opposed to evolution. And that's just, that's just fine. This is not what I'm discussing here, so don't make a mistake. What I'm talking about is the present state of the human being, no matter how you've decided it got there, okay? So we're going to, we're going to, we're going to avoid this particular conflict, and I will not make, make my opinion noted here. I will instead let you realize clearly that we are not discussing this at the present time. What we're discussing is the present state of the human being, regardless of how it got to where it is. When I was growing up, I was told by my mother that it was important for me to eat meat. Okay, she told me it was important to eat meat. Johnny, she'd say, you have to eat meat because if you don't, you won't get your protein. And I would chew and chew and chew and chew this piece of beef until I'd get it chewed into this round, fibrous ball that I couldn't swallow. And I'd eventually take it and stick it under the edge of my plate or pass it off to the dog. Now, if my mother knew the things that I just taught you about protein needs, she would have said to me, Johnny, don't eat that meat. You got the wrong kind of teeth. Feed it to the dog. That's the animal that should eat the meat, she would have said. Now, when people make a mistake and try and eat meat, what happens is it often gets stuck in their windpipe, and they have what we call coronary cafes. Cafe coronaries, cafe coronaries. And these cafe coronaries where the meat gets stuck in the trachea, and that's why we have the Heimlich maneuver to take and pop that chunk of meat out. Nobody gets a cafe coronary from eating rice or potatoes. <laughs> Compare the teeth of a carnivore with the teeth of a vegetarian. You know, a chimpanzee is a vegetarian. Basically, they live on leaves and roots and bark, and they do eat animals, by the way. They do eat little tiny animals, like termites and little tiny rodents, they do. But it's not for nutritional needs, it's a social thing. It raises the status in the family. If you go out, a male goes out and catches a little animal and brings it back to the females, okay, it's a status thing. 
But look at the teeth of that chimpanzee and compare it to the teeth of a true carnivore versus the teeth of a human being. Now, I'm going to make this statement, and I know it's going to bother some of you, and I know you'll try and contest with me over it, but observe more than a sample of one. I've talked over probably 100,000 dentists and dental hygienists in my career. And every time I go to speak, I say to them, I would like you to show me the incisor teeth, the canine teeth in a human being's mouth. I want you to show me the teeth that were designed to reach out, puncture, and kill an animal. And they always point to the four. The four here, okay? If you, okay? Now, you know, when I did this last week with a group of doctors, one lady came up and tried to show me her fangs. <laughs> Admittedly, they were a little more pointy than the lady I just showed you, but they're in no way near that of the cat, and you should get the point. On the tip of our tongue is a taste bud for carbohydrate. We are designed as seekers of carbohydrate. You know that on the tip of a cat's tongue are taste buds for aminos. They're designed to seek out meat, aminos, aminos, protein, amino acids. They, the cat does not have taste buds for saccharides, sugar. Why? Because they're not designed to eat these things. Whereas we have taste buds for only saccharides as far as calorie given substance. We have no taste buds for protein. There are all kinds of other qualities about the human being that tell you that we have to be living in, and those of you who believe in evolution, we have to have evolved in a plant-based surrounding. Why? Because we have, we have a lack of enzymes to make, excuse me, we, we have a lack of enzymes to make certain things that are, that are necessary for us that would be found in plant foods. For example, ascorbic acid. Ascorbic acid, you may know as vitamin C, but in a cat, it's not vitamin C. Why? Because it's not a vitamin. Why? Because a cat can make it. Whereas people, it's called vitamin C ascorbic acid is. Why? It's a vitamin. Why? Because we can't make it. Now, why can a cat make it and we can't? Well, because we are in an environment of plant foods and plants make vitamin C. So why would we need to be able to synthesize it? It makes no sense. Whereas a cat is an environment lacking plant foods, so it's going to have to have ascorbic acid. It's got to make it. Same thing with certain kinds of fats. For example, arachidonic acid is found in meat. The cat cannot make arachidonic acid. It must be in the diet, so they must eat meat. Whereas we, we can make arachidonic acid from linoleic acid, which is a plant, a plant uh, substance. See, there, so there are all these things that relate our personal state as of now to an environment of us living in, living in plant foods. Here's a couple of other examples. Our brain burns with high preference glucose, carbohydrate. Remember, carbohydrate's only in plants. If we don't have carbohydrate, the brain will adjust and burn fats, but only under great duress. And it doesn't think very good when it's burning fats either. My proof is your friends that eat the Atkins diet. <laughs> no, there's actually scientific proof to that too. So the brain burns glucose as its preferential fuel. Carbohydrate, glucose, comes from plants. Red blood cells won't burn anything else. If you don't have carbohydrate in your diet, say you've done something foolish like go on the Atkins diet or you starve to death, the body will actually take protein and make glucose to feed the red blood cells. Now, why would we not have enzymes or why would we have systems that are so dependent on carbohydrates? Because our creator never intended us to live in an environment without the carbohydrate. Or for those of you who believe in evolution, we would have not evolved in a system without carbohydrate. In other words, if our evolution was for four million years or more in a carbohydrate sufficient environment, why would we have to have enzymes to make things that are always there? Or why would it be important that the red blood cells only burn glucose because it's always around? Okay. Anyway, there are other changes that make us clearly plant eaters. For example, our stomach has a very low concentration 
of acid in it, whereas the stomach of a carnivore is very high acid so it can digest the meat. Our gallbladder forms gallstones, which are made of cholesterol. Gallstones are, are, occur as a consequence of supersaturation of the bile with cholesterol. And you know cholesterol is only present in animal products. We also back that cholesterol up in our system, whereas a dog and a cat, they don't do that. These meat-eating animals, they don't do that. You can take a dog and a cat and you can feed them egg yolks. Pure egg yolks all day long. What the dog and cat do is their liver just cranks it up, increases the metabolism, takes the, that cholesterol, turns it into bile acids, and excretes it out the bowel. So you never back it up into the arteries or concentrate it in the gallbladder. And they never get artery disease, and they never get gallbladder disease, a dog and a cat. Whereas people, that's not the case. So what's your conclusion? We were born with the wrong kind of livers, right? Somebody made a mistake. No, your conclusion is, is we shouldn't be eating like a dog and a cat. You knew that. Okay. Another example has to do with the bowel. The long intestinal tract of, of a, a human being is like other plant-eating animals. It's very complicated. It's convoluted. It's got these sacculations that we call hostras, which are typical of people who eat plant-based diets, whereas a cat has a very, uh, very tube-like short intestinal tract for quickly digesting and getting rid of the remnants of the meat. In other words, everything about our anatomy and physiology tells us that we should be plant eaters, eaters and Cats should be, cats should be uh, meat eaters. How about when it, you guys are all hot? How does, how does a plant eating animal cool themselves? I've been watching you guys. I have not seen one of you panting. How does a meat eating animal cool itself? Not a one of you have seen panting. I'm waiting. You're all sweating, just like other plant-eating animals. And when it comes to drinking, how, I'm going to watch you at dinner tonight. How does a plant-eating animal cool, uh, drink water? It sips. And how does a meat-eater? I better not see any of you laughing tonight either. Okay. Oh, jeez. What's your thoughts? Okay. Then what's your thoughts about this? Why? why? I didn't do that to be mean, but why do you, why do you react that way? You think, you think your cat would react that way? You think you put carrots down in front of your cat or, you know, a pineapple? You think your cat's going to get excited about it? No, it's because, because of the fact that you were created to respond positively to fruits and vegetables and disgustingly to the first scene I showed you. This is not an accident. Okay. So it goes all the way to anatomy, physiology, psychology, mental, and so on. All right, let's take a look at the world picture. If you look around the world, you see people who eat uh, high carbohydrate diets are trim and healthy. Those are people in Africa, Asia, uh, the Middle East. People who eat low carbohydrate, in other words, low plant food diets like the United States and Western Europe are fat and sick. Your friends, this is one of the things that you want to tell your friends. When they say, carbohydrates are bad for you, they make you fat and sick. You shouldn't be eating carbohydrates. They told, don't they tell you that? Don't they tell you that carbohydrates turn to sugar, it makes you fat? Don't eat carbohydrates, that's how you get diabetes, they tell you all these things? Okay, you stop them and you say, well, wait a minute. How about the millions, in fact, probably over a billion people in the world who live on carbohydrate as their meal plan? Let's go to Asia for a minute and look at the, the people from Asia. In Asian countries, the same word for rice is food. For example, in Japan, cooked rice, the, same, the word for cooked rice is meal. And for breakfast, it's called morning rice. That's the word in Japan. In China, it is exactly the same word for rice and food. And in China, they have an expression, a meal without rice is like a beautiful woman with only one eye. <laughs> Don't you think that says it all? Or instead of saying, how are you, the Chinese ask, have you had your rice today? In India, the rice, rice is the first food a new bride offers her husband. In, Indo in Indonesia, no marriage until she can skillfully prepare rice. That's how important those carbohydrates are. All athletes, all endurance athletes, follow high-carbohydrate diets without exception. I mean, if they're going to win. 
Here's some of the athletes I've had a chance to work with. Carl Lewis is probably my most famous athlete. I met Carl Lewis in 1990, taught him the McDougal diet. Subsequent to that, he describes the next three years following our diet as the best years of his whole career. He set the world record for the 100 meter dash. He did the three best long jumps ever done, and he won three gold medals on our program. And in fact, in his cookbook that came out a couple of years ago, I mentioned twice. It's called Very Vegetarian. Uh, Mary All, she's taken between number two and number nine in triathlons, women's triathlons all over the world. She could hardly run before she discovered a high carbohydrate diet, and she wears t-shirts and hats to say, I'm on the McDougal diet. And then we have Ruth Heydrich. Many of you know Ruth Heydrich. If you don't, I'm sure she's going to be a guest here to speak sometime in the near future. Fantastic lady. I've known her for 22 years. She came to my office 22 years ago, Ruth did. She had been a marathon runner for 12 years, but a disaster hit her. She developed breast cancer and it metastasized to her lungs. And she came in to see me and she said, is there anything I can do? And I said, well, you know, I don't really know, but I, this is what I would do. I would change my diet. And she said, well, I don't really know what you're talking about or probably don't even believe what you're saying. And I said, well, look, here's a couple of file cabinets full of research material. Why don't you sit down and read it? And so she spent two days in my office. And that day she changed her diet. And this year she expects to win her 1,000th gold medal as a triathlon runner and she'll be 70 years old. Now, don't, don't misinterpret me. I'm not trying to tell you that a plant-based diet is going to cure cancer. But, you know, there are people who have gotten miraculous health benefits from eating a plant-based diet. So just to summarize, all the evidence points to a plant-based diet. Religion, economy, this is the cheapest way to eat. I can take you to Costco and I can feed your family for four for $30 for a month. Uh, the epidemiologic data, which I showed you in relationship to disease, animal rights. The animals are real happy if you're not a meat eater. Environmental issues, human history, scientific research, athletic performance, anatomy, physiology. Everything says you should be a plant eater, and everybody knows it. In fact, they know it to the point where we can have cartoons like this. This was Bizarro. He says, uh, I'll have the cruelty tortured for its entire life, kept alive with drugs, slaughtered inhumanely, processed unsanitarily, and cooked at very high temperatures to kill the salmonella sandwich. <laughs> and she says, uh, fries with that. Now, why is that funny? It's funny because everybody knows that meat is a serious health hazard. In fact, the problems with meat in our diet are extensive, and you could artificially divide them into different categories and focus on specific nutrients. It's artificial, because it's really the whole picture that causes the problem. It's not just the, the fact that it's high calorie, it promotes cancer and obesity and diabetes. It's the fact that it's high fat. It's the fact that it lacks fiber. It's all kinds of qualities of the meat products. They are high calorie, high fat, high in saturated fat, high in protein, high in acid, which wipes out your bones and gives you osteoporosis, high in cholesterol, which rots your arteries, high in iron, which rots your arteries, no dietary fiber, no carbohydrate, no vitamin C, no calcium, deficient in essential fatty acids, loaded with environmental contaminants, cooked to produce more carcinogens, and full of microbes, tons of microbes. So now that you know all this, what you need to ask yourself, and if you happen to be a physician, what you need to ask about your patients is just a very simple question. How much plant food am I going to include in my diet, and how much animal food am I going to exclude? Really, I mean, because all the evidence, I just showed it to you, all the evidence from every point of view says you should be eating more plants and less meat. So the only question on the table is how much? As a doctor, I've only been able to give one kind of advice. People come to me and they said to me, Dr. McDougall, I'm tired of coughing and I don't want to get lung cancer. How many cigarettes should I smoke? <laughs> okay. You know, my liver hurts. How much more whiskey should I drink? You come to me and you say, look, you know, I love this husband of mine. He's had one heart attack. How much meat should I feed him? Well, how good is his insurance? Just kidding. You got the answer, right? Okay. Let's talk about vegetarian diets for just a minute. Vegetarian diets, uh, there are all kinds of them, and I want to make clear that I am not a vegetarian, first of all. Now, I'm not a vegetarian. I refuse to be a vegetarian until vegetarians become healthy. I eat turkey every other Thanksgiving in protest of being called a vegetarian. <laughs> now, when all the other vegetarians that you see speak here or you meet in your 
your goings on in the world are trim and healthy and uh, an example of good health, then I'll become a vegetarian. But until then, I'll pr protest every other Thanksgiving. Because some vegetarians are very unhealthy. For example, we have vegetarians that live on chicken and fish, and they call themselves vegetarians. They live on uh, dairy and eggs, and they're full of fat and full of cholesterol. Then we have the doughboy vegetarians who live on sugar and white flour. And then we have the wino doughboy vegetarians that are drunks. There are lots of those. They're still vegetarians. Then we have the soy boys that live on fake food. They have fake bacon for breakfast, fake turkey for lunch, fake cheese sandwiches for dinner, fake ice cream, fake everything. It's a fake diet. It's not healthy. And we have the greasy vegetarians and we have the raw fooders. Raw fooders live on nuts and seeds and, and fruit. In other words, they live on fat and sugar. That's not what I try and teach. I try and teach a whole plant food based diet with exercise and clean habits. And if you happen to want to, uh, to eat unhealthy foods on occasion, that should be your choice. This is the diet that's starch-centered with the addition of fruits and vegetables. Be sure to understand that starch is the center. It is not a diet of broccoli, cauliflower, and sprouts. Not enough calories. It is a diet. It is a diet based on starches like rice, corn, potatoes, beans, and so on. Now, there's these foods which are supposed to be delicacies. These are rich foods for special occasion. But in America, we have a holiday every meal. We start out with breakfast for Easter for breakfast, and we go on to Thanksgiving and Christmas for lunch and dinner, and then we have a birthday party after dinner. The kind of results that we get on this kind of diet are weight loss, about five pounds for men, four pounds for women, and that's eating as much as they want, as long as they want, or as often as they want. We also have long-term results. We did a study with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Minnesota. We were able to decrease their health care costs for the employees by 44% per year, and the weight loss was an average of 36 pounds, or in other words, a 17% loss in body weight maintained over a year. And that's what long-term weight loss shows when you take and look at studies, for example, the National Weight Loss Registry, which involves about 5,000 people that have lost on average 70 pounds and kept it off an average of six years. Their diet exclusively is a low-fat, high-carbohydrate diet. None of the people involved in this registry are on the Atkins diet. Our diet lowers cholesterol 29 points on average in 11 days. If you start with high cholesterol, the drops are 65 points in 11 days. We drop triglycerides in half with this kind of diet. Drop blood pressures, 7 over 5 millimeters of mercury. That's the whole group. But if you start with high blood pressure, say, uh, 150 over 90 or greater, the average drop is 23 over 14 millimeters of mercury, and we stop all their blood pressure medications, by the way, in almost every case. So the question is, is you've been faced with the science and the knowledge, what are your excuses for not eating a healthy diet? One of the big excuses I find in people is indestructible genes. Okay, they have good heredity, and I want to introduce you quickly to a couple of people. One is my, my great-grandmother. My great-grandmother, she's called Old Mom. She lived to be 106 years old. When I was growing up, she would tell me, John, you eat too much meat. It's going to make you sick. And after I became a vegetarian, she was about 103, she sent me out to get her a hamburger. And I brought back a little hamburger for her, you know, the one with the paper-thin meat and the little, little, little white bread bun with a pickle? I brought her back one of those. And she set it down in front of her, cut it in quarters, proceeded to eat two quarters, picked up one quarter, shook it in my face, and said, if you'd eat a little more meat, you'd be healthier, and then put those two quarters away for later on. Okay, she was healthy because she was a moderate person. I am not a moderate person. I do everything with lust, <laughs> with gusto. Okay, and I've learned that about myself, and some of you are the same way. So if you're like I am, you know, I don't smoke two cigarettes, I smoke two packs. I don't drink a small bit of wine, I drink the whole bottle. You know, I don't have a little tiny piece of hamburger like she does. I have two double pounders. So if you discover that about yourself and you're like me, then what you've got to do is surround yourself with good things and just focus on good habits. And then that was my grandfather, old Pop. Now, he ate the rich American diet, too. Eggs for breakfast and meat and onions for dinner. Well, he didn't do so well the last 15 years of his life. The last 15 years of his life, he couldn't walk because he had such severe atherosclerosis in his arteries. He lived to be 87, but he eventually died of kidney failure. His life would have been so much better, even as tough as he is, it would have been so much better if he'd ate a healthy diet. 
So my message and final message to you is, is that if you want the health that you deserve and your family deserves, take it serious. I've given you the evidence there's really no way around it. You need to change your diet, you need to minimize your meat and your dairy intake, and you need to maximize your plant food intake, and you will have the kind of health that was intended for you. People were not intended to be fat. They were not intended to be sick. They were intended to look good, feel good, and function well for a lifetime. And if it's not happening that way in your life, it's not because God made a mistake. Okay? It's, it's not because you have some genetic problem. It's not because of some other mystery or you caught a virus. It's because you have been incorrectly taught how to feel yourself and your family. And once you make those changes, because of these, these healing and life-giving forces that are in all of us, you get well. You get off your medications. You enjoy good health. It's really that simple. I can't make it any more complicated for you. Thank you very much. We hope you have enjoyed this presentation.